Hello, my friend, and welcome to the 439th episode of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today, we have Mr. Nicholas Kimlam. He is um, an immigrant, came over to the U.S. in 2012. He was 51 years old, came from Austria, didn't know anybody, and he wanted to start from scratch. He had built an app and wanted to make it big. You know, his attitude was salespeople are wealth creators and peace producers. I'm like, hey, that's kind of cool. So uh, he built a cool CRM. Uh, We'll talk about that. We'll link to it. And um, I think you will like this, especially as we're going through this COVID-19 stuff, this entrepreneurial mindset, this can-do mindset, this salespreneur mindset is, um, is important to embrace and appreciate you know he talks about ignoring the naysayers Um, you know he's just an optimistic guy making things happen and um, we need more people like him so I think you'll get a lot out of it Um, as I mentioned before um, if you're looking for some training if you're looking for some support if things are tough and you're looking to surround yourself with a crowd of motivated people come join me you know 30daysalesgrowth.com Use promo code APRIL for 50% off. It's month to month, or you get a year uh, at 50% off. So it's your choice. And um, it's on-demand content. It's live weekly calls. It's Q&A with me at any time. Ask a question in the group, and we'll hop on. So, you know, support yourself. Invest in yourself right now. It's my best advice. It's always been my best advice, okay? 30daysalesgrowth.com. But now let's bring on Nicholas. Nicholas Kimla from uh, Austria via Los Angeles, right? Founder of Pipeliner Sales. Welcome to the Sales Podcast, man. How the heck are you? Yeah, it's great. All right. Thanks for, for inviting me. So I'm happy to tell a little bit about our background, what happened and what's going on. Yeah, I had I had to uh, uh, put you on hold so I could hit record. I mean, what uh, an amazing story. You are in the tech space, the CRM space. Uh, immigrated from Austria, but as you were saying just before I hit record, I mean, you you came over, you were what, 50? I was 51. Wow. Yeah, so normally in my country, are most people when they're in this kind of age, they are looking already a little bit towards retirement, but not giving up everything and are uh, bringing the whole family over and starting from scratch a company in the U.S., so is it true you were you just drank too much beer and you were you were drinking all the beer for and they, they had to cancel Oktoberfest if they didn't kick you out? Was that was that the deal? Uh, the deal is, you know, in, in Austria, the people are drinking wine. Uh, we are oh. famous for white wine, the best oh. white wine in the world. Yeah. Wow. Uh, oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, oh, and- that sounds like are you is that um, a challenge? I'm out here in Temecula wine country. You know, we got. Yeah, uh, yeah. This, about that, that 50 was- wineries. So uh, you bring some Austrian wine out here and let's, let's do a little taste test. Oh, uh, you will, if you drink uh, a Grüner Wettliner, you will never drink anything else in the white area. Uh, so be, be careful so, if you want to compete with the Austrian white wines. <laughs> so I, I want to know which, which one pairs best with uh, bourbon. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I uh, no, uh, but you, Anyhow, let's go back. Uh, so this is uh, this is definitely our uh, 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 Austria is not only uh, one of the most beautiful countries in the world uh, for visiting and uh, you know Austrians are born with little skis. Yeah, we come out. <laughs> <laughs> but not only that, uh, it's really about Mozart and uh, and 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 the balls and uh, and enjoying life. Yeah, it's a. It, uh, one of the famous composer at the last century was saying he was the director also of the Viennese opera. He said, if the world goes down, if the end of the world is happening around the world, then move to Vienna because in Vienna it goes down 25 years later. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow. Hey, you know what? I think um, I'm all for that. I think things are going too fast. People aren't um, stopping and smelling the roses, huh? Yeah, well, anyhow, so our, for me, it was our, in my age to have the confidence and to really to back my stuff and move to the States 
was because my team and I have created already one world hit, or we created the biggest banking compliance solution in the world that was acquired by Thomson Reuters. We had 85% market share before Thomson Reuters are acquired it. And our, that was really quite our, an endeavor our, from the beginning to the sale our, to do everything from the data centers, from programming, hosting, supporting. And so we were knowing our, when you do this, our, you can our, beat our, the others or you can challenge the others because CRM space is really a challenge. It's, it's, it's hundreds of softwares out there. Yeah? And so I was convinced if I come to the U.S., I have to do a very different approach than normally people would take. And that was quite our, an endeavor because when you not go the normal way, as you would expect, uh, you have to come up with a completely different strategy. And we did that and we succeeded. So... Let's dig into that because I've been in, I've been heavily involved in CRMs for decades. Uh, it is a crowded space. There is a lot of confusion. Um, people don't know how to buy it. They don't know how to install it. They don't know how to use it. Uh, they don't know how to upgrade it. They don't know how to leverage it. Uh, so how did you, so, all right, well, let's back up though. You're, you're hanging out in Austria. You just sold your company. Um, how many people did you keep, right? Did they, that a lot of them go over with the with, 50. So, so 50 stayed back. 50 programmers were really starting to, and that was poor coincidence, the CRM space, because you see, we had in the banking, we had every, our data centers with IBM servers, our failover servers and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it's a long story. But the point is I was invited by IBM to a conference our, for sales, our management and ideas. And or there was a guy who was a trainer internationally for IBM or um, um, different parts of the world. He was giving this lecture. And after three days or, of or hearing him and saw what he presented on the screen, I felt, wow, that's cool. So I walked up to him and said, I buy that. Or, this is knowledge of 30, 40 years of knowledge of IBM. Um, by the way, is IBM using it? And he said, no. And I said, why? Because they are legally um, bind to use uh, Siebel, yeah? from Tom Siebel. Yeah? And, and uh, the point was, um, he said then the magic word that changed my life. He said, All right, this is not a software. This is an Excel file. And I said, wow. Uh, and then the journey started because in that moment, my entrepreneurial brain started and said, well, you are a trainer. You're not a programmer. This is a file. Can I use that file? And, and, and so it started. Uh, we had no clue when I was going back to my programmers and to the architects and everyone, when we said, let's take a look at that. Can we make out of this a software? how much effort that would be at that time. I was really, I was very um, naive a little bit in that area yeah? and saying, because then we were really investigating a lot. We were looking, we were going deeply into everything and said, first of all, what is that, the idea? And then the other thing was about what is our competitors doing? Yeah? Who, who, what is the landscape? Right. Uh, that was 2007. Yeah. And at that time, our HTML5 and all was not that, ex it was not really with the libraries and with the components that you can use today, not so far. Um, it was at the, the beginning, it was really, you could not do a lot in HTML5. Yeah? Uh, right. Therefore, we were looking for different kinds of technologies. Okay, so let's, let's, let's hold on. So you are, you just sold your company, fit, you got 50 people, I mean, uh, did they make enough in the buyout? They could just kind of no, no. I, see I was, what was happening. I mean, what? How are you putting food on the table for these fifty people? Good question. First of all, I have not sold the company. I was the brain in the technical area and hosting and everything. Okay. And our and when the company was our first sold or to an. Um, equity fund in Boston, Spectrum Equity, are, I was still involved in everything. 
And when it was sold to Thomson Reuters, I still was involved. We had over, over 10 years contracts. We reinvested all our money, what we made in, 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 in the new product. We took nothing out of the company and reinvested everything. All right. So all of you are working it's still in the company from the acquisition. And then you get this idea. Did you get funding for the new idea and then bring some of your people with you away from? Only from the ownership. Okay. We have no outside. Yeah. We as owners are, we invested a lot. I invested a <laughs> tremendous. Okay. So, and so who's the first person you hired? Was, uh, it, was it developers? No, the developers were there. We had the team, we split the team and we built it everything from scratch. And so our, at, definitely at the beginning was developers. Yeah, sure. Definitely. It was the right. developers. And then uh, later on, our, I realized our living in Vienna our, and our start moving the company in some areas. Uh, quickly, I realized if I really want to succeed, if I really want to challenge, yeah, uh, I have to move to the U.S. And then it, this this was an endeavor in itself in my age, yeah, because right. where to go and 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 how you do that, yeah. But this is this can fill a book. <laughs> uh, yeah, and it was 2007 that you moved. No, our, our, I started thinking about that in the year 2011, uh, and I moved 2012. Okay. Eight years, almost. And did you just come alone? Did you bring a no. small team? No, none, none. Or I just came with my family, with my wife and my son. So you wanted to just have feet on the ground here to uh, mm. just bring more resources and visibility to the company? Yeah, our, I would say to build everything around sales and marketing and about content and what we did then. Yeah. Yep. So 2007 to 2012, I mean, that's a good chunk of time. Uh, it took us a so year. It, was, it took us a year alone. Or we were very, very keen on figuring out. Uh, we interviewed a lot of people. We were searching for technology. We were investigating how we do that. We were investigating our... In, this this is a long story. This will fill books really if we go this route, yeah. Uh, because our even I was at that time. Our I, I was originally one of the first. Was my other company, uh, the Apple Centers in in Europe. Our, and our, I had a, another part of that that was really keen to Microsoft. Um, and so I was working with Microsoft, and our I, the originally idea was not to build. Um, a competitive product are to Salesforce and Microsoft Dynamics. It was to just produce pipeliner, the pipeline management, the opportunity lead management only to Microsoft Dynamics as an extension. That was the originally first idea. Uh, but that was dying after a couple of years because Microsoft came to me and said, it's killed. The project is too far. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were too good or too far, whatever. Gotcha. So then you got to change gears, right? Exactly. No, I had, or I had to make the decision. Either I'm uh, cutting down and be just really a little add on. And then I said we were going too far already. And so I had to hop on the gas. And that was really the big change when everything started. And we said, okay, then we have to build it really. Yeah. Well, and that's the problem of building on land you don't own. Yeah. Right. And I tell people this all the time, but certainly with social media marketing, you know, I'm like, you got to own your list. Facebook can kill you anytime they want. YouTube, earlier this year, YouTube, like the number one earning uh, personality on YouTube was this kid, right? With his family. He, I don't know, he would unbox toys and stuff, made 23, 26 million dollars. YouTube at the beginning of the year said, yeah, we're not going to allow that anymore. Thanks, but no thanks. And shut them down. Wow. Yeah, so no, this is this is our you got to have your own right is that is that did that scare you a little bit You're like oh man we got to do our own thing now so people don't do this to us again yes our and therefore i had to come up with a completely different strategy our because you see the product in itself is not the issue it's really as you said there 
the distribution of the product, however we call that, and then our, how you get awareness and how you enter into the market. And our, I had to come up with our, a very different approach. And the first things that are, when I came to the States was immediately, uh, was not or to hiring our people uh, in some areas, it was to building a content team. And so I created our, in our industry, the biggest content platform today that is in our industry existing salespop.net. We have right now over 1000 uh, contributors. We have almost on a daily basis a TV channel. I hired then later on, uh, very soon, John Golden, who is my chief strategy officer and um, um, salespop.net. Go there. Uh, and you will see that immediately. The point is we, with John Golden, I built it up uh, and um, he was the president and CEO of uh, uh, Hootsuite, uh, the trainings organization. He was running that for seven years or six and a half years, whatever. But, um, and that was sold for, uh, I think, a couple hundred million. And then the point was how we do that, yeah? how we built that. And so we created right now the biggest content that's available in sales. Because I realized, first of all, I don't want to build a CRM system that is for everyone. I concentrate only on salespeople, B2B, not transactional, only really with a process. We are a process engine, pipeline, yeah, pipeline management. And so our tool is not for single users. You can use that. I'm not saying you cannot use that, yeah? But it's not built for that. Yeah? It could be that a single user have a very structural process. And so I created a tool um, that you can really in the B2B area creating. And therefore, the first thing was the content. And so um, the content platform that took me a couple of years to build that because you see you start by zero. I had nothing. Yeah? And then creating that, uh, and I'm writing by myself a lot. I have over almost 60 eBooks. Yeah? And, our, and, our, and, and really, I don't know, a couple of millions of, of page views. But the point is, when I, I just got into this area, I realized I had to change something. And when you think on the funnel, think of the funnel of what I need to change. For me, it was clear, and I was uh, in Austria. And Austria, this means it's even worse than in the US about salespeople. Salespeople still have today a bad reputation. Pushy, slicky, greedy, whatever you name. And it comes from a long history because our, I realized that all the Hollywood movies that have been made, as nice as they are, when we look at some of them, yeah, uh, we know some of these beautiful sales movies, uh, Alec Baldwin and then our, uh, 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 DiCaprio, all of them, but are not nice people. And this is what uh, most people are uh, thinking of sales. Salespeople are pushy, are, are not... But the realizing that this is something we have to change because sales is the most important thing. And it's interesting that today, all the troubles that we have in the last couple of years in trade, what is trade? Trade is selling. Yeah? And, and at the end of the day, the whole human race started with trade. <laughs> if there would be no trade, we would be nowhere. <laughs> if not, someday the guy who was maybe hunting a, a deer would say to the other, hey, here you have apples or you have oranges or banana, let's trade that. Yeah, we wouldn't be nowhere. And I think salespeople, are, and originally this is the, the core idea that I created and I gave them a term. I call salespeople salespreneurs. Why? Because a salesperson is an entrepreneur in an enterprise. He's not taking full risk, but he's taking a lot of risk. And in some areas, they live full on commission. So they have a lot of risk, but they have not created the product. They have not created the structure, but there's, they live. Go to a hospital and say to the doctor, if you have a, 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 a tremendous, um, I would say, operation, I pay you after everything is done. Do you think he would start? Yep. Amen. So, so for me, it was the awareness to change on the big scope. I realized that there is more than about 30% of the workforce 
at the end of the day is ending up in a sales related job. And this is why I believe sales will get more. We can see that for, for instance, when you go to Apple, to the Apple store, there is today a lot of <laughs> hundreds in Santa Monica where I, where I live close by. Yeah. When I go to the Apple store, you have 400 people there. Right. Yeah. Salespeople. So I created that. Our, and, and now the funnel is really what, what is it? Salespeople are, are so crucial to society. Why? Because at the end of the day, sales is creating wealth. If you sell something, you create wealth. And if I would punch you in the face, it would be hard to sell you something. So isn't that true? Well, no, then, then it'd be easy to sell me an ice pack or <laughs> uh, martial arts training. <laughs> no, but you know what I'm talking about, yeah? Right. <laughs> so I, I say salespeople are wealth creator and peace producer. And this is what we need. Right. We need. And through that, we have right now created around the world. We are growing rapidly in that area. Uh, we have right now alone in Africa, uh, not only in Nigeria, in Tanzania, in Zambia, or whatever, almost 1,000 people in training. And so our, the interesting thing is that our, um, I strongly believe the mindset to change that doesn't um, produce immediately an outcome for me, but it helps to get awareness. So this is the strategy that we have used um, to get our, a different approach out. Because if I just would spend only Google AdWords, yeah, against Salesforce or Mar Microsoft or Oracle, it doesn't make sense. So how did you make, I mean, this transition, I mean, that's a big, there's a lot going on there. I like to kind of back it down and say, all right, well, what are some of the first things you did, right? So somebody, if somebody has an idea, right? How, how did you validate that idea? Because on the one hand, uh, you, you had one idea and it, it was right, but it was, you had the wrong partner. You built it on somebody else's land. It got ripped out from under you, right? Then you, you have momentum, you have some assets, but you have to shift gears. I mean, how, how did y'all decide, it's right? Which direction to go? Did it, did you have to put in more money? You know, how did y'all decide, all right, we'll, we'll go that, that route because that's, I mean, that's tough, right? You're, you're heading down a certain path and then it's like, okay, this is a dead end. Some people quit. Some people are like, well, let's just cut my losses. I'm going back and, and never mind. This was a silly idea. You know, how, how do you make that transition when things ended with Microsoft? Um. But wow, that was tough. It was super tough. Or, but or, I, I just felt or I was on the way and or, I, I, I believed in the idea to change something. I really, you see, I'm coming strongly from the mindset that are, um, don't listen to the naysayer. Or, and my vision was there that I realized salespeople could make a difference. And when we made their investigation and we were speaking to most salespeople, they said, oh, we don't like CRM. It doesn't bring any benefit. It sucks. And so I said, when everybody, you see, um, I, I was an Apple hair dealer in, in the, in, in, in really in the early days, I was even working for Apple and on campus and then I brought that to the universities. But anyhow, the point is that I said, you see, I have never seen that someone brought back an iPhone to Apple. Maybe there is one, but you know what I'm talking. Bring back and say, that sucks. <laughs> I've not seen that. Yeah. So why an industry that is geared around salespeople and salespeople don't like it? So I felt, okay, there is an opportunity. The opportunity has to be to talk to them and to create a product that is appealing to them. And not from the management perspective, because the manager gets anyhow the data when the people like it. And so you, you use what you like, what you like, you lose. Yeah? And so I created the most visual CRM tool in the world. And that's it. If you go right now to Cheat to Crowd, we are one of the leading companies in the trending. If you go there, you will see we are right now on the top nine. And uh, compared to others, they have funding of hundreds of millions. I feel our, we did a good job that other people are rating that mm -hmm. and responding to this. Yeah? 
So that was giving me the strength because all of these people said always, we don't like it. So I said, okay, what is if I build the tool that you would like to use? Mm -hmm. Did you get some, like some early beta users to sign off or agree to pay to use it once it was done? Or, you know, how did yes. you get that first little bit of revenue? Yes. Or, uh, um, it was, it, that was a very long and our uh, process because definitely you, you have better users. And because we, we started at this time, you see in the year 2007, eight, our, uh, when we started really programming, we were clear, we need a framework and we used the framework because we, the, the point was we said, okay, the text paste at that time, our HTML stuff that was out there was not giving a real visual uh, interaction. So we had to come up with a technology that's a framework. And there was at this time only two frameworks out there, uh, one from Microsoft and the other from Adobe. Mm -hmm. And we, you, uh, we have chosen at that time Adobe Air as a framework because you could do a lot of games were produced at that time with Adobe Air because I believe gaming uh, as a, a, a playful approach and salespeople are playful people. They like to play. Yeah? Um, all right, so we did our Adobe and I showed that to Adobe and Adobe figured it out and they called us. Yeah? Adobe called me. Yeah? And so I flew over there. Yeah? And so we had a, with the head guys in San Francisco, we had a great meeting. And they helped us at the beginning and they made even a, a PR message and they put us on, on Adobe side. And that was even so early that I could not believe because I was not knowing, or I was not aware at all of that stuff, what could happen. Um, and the Adobe side where we got a little bit of traction brought us immediately because at that time we had in our product, it, it was our a hybrid model. That means it was in the cloud, but also you had to download it on your computer yeah, hybrid, um, uh, we had in the first day 67,000 downloads and in the first couple of weeks, 2 million, 2 million downloads. Yeah. Thanks. So I, I knew I was hitting something. Right. How'd you get the word out for that kind of growth? Adobe was doing that for me. Oh, well, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but it, I was not prepared for that. Yeah. I was yeah, sometimes prepared. a bunch of sales is uh, a product. I remember years ago, I think it was a Super Bowl commercial. Uh -huh. And these people, you know, they were launching. Yeah. And so they're all gathered around and they, they wait, and they wait, and they wait. And then ding, like there's their first order. And they all start cheering. And then, <laughs> you know, and they all look at each other. And so, it, you know, whatever the offer was, probably IBM or somebody, you know, need to scale or whatever, you know. Yeah, it's, yeah. It can be a problem, right? Now you can't fulfill. Yeah. Uh, you get server, you know, downtime and outage. Now people are complaining. They want refunds. You're terrible. Sure. So you have to build the structure first. Yeah. Yeah, but how how do you know? Even Apple, over all these years, they 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 finally have it dialed in. But they had they were down multiple for multiple launches. You know they you you think you're ready for the growth, but when you hit that kind, like you said, you weren't ready. I mean, did you build for 2 million no, instances the, that quick? No, no, definitely not. Or did I, but you see, our, I, I always look around where really process builders are. And for me, the phenomenal person that we all follow, and he's not only the richest person right now in the world, but for many, many years, I remember for more than 10 years, everybody was against him. He was, he was crucified from investors, from everyone. Jeff Bezos was hated. And uh, parallel, he built the AWS platform, and it's the best. We are in the AWS, and we have really searched around. We spoke with IBM. We spoke with, with uh, they wanted us. We spoke with Microsoft. But AWS was really amazing from the structure, from the flexibility. And that was hidden. That was hidden when he came out, and then he brought his first numbers. But he is a master of processes. And to get the processes right takes time and costs money. Yeah, this right. is not coming overnight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you cannot do that in one moment, in, in one month, one year. And so 
in the CRM space, the majority of all the products that are out there today are not really CRM tools, they are add-ons. There are additional add-ons, yeah? Why? Because the complexity of CRM, as we figured it out, costs you years to program. Yeah. Lead management, opportunity management, activity management, our, um, our contact are in that area going deeper, account management, our, um, then it goes in the reporting engine that you need on that, uh, data import, our duplication checker, but come on. <laughs> All of that cannot be done and you cannot bring just that in a room a little bit, programming and putting that together, that needs a lot of wisdom, how to do that, that it's efficient, that it's smooth, that it's easy, and all of that. And so, therefore, everybody tries to hook into Salesforce as an add-on, the majority. Yeah? And right. there is January, really a few only system out there, are there real, real CRMs that we call. Yeah? Right. So you make a true standalone. And, and there is a difference. And there is a difference. Uh, we made also the decision, or as many as our competitors are doing, we believe in best of breed. I don't believe conceptually in the sweet approach. Why? Because I know from programming and having big teams and really have over 25 years, so we are not youngsters. We know what we do. We know how complex that is. And you cannot shift a programmer from one, um, let's say, ticketing system to marketing and then to a CRM and then to sales and then again to the ticketing. Uh, if you want to do something good, you need this team. Okay, you can have four or five different teams for all your products, but how many companies can afford that when they're starting? Well, but how, how do you decide what to include and not include, right? They talk about the MVP, the minimum viable product. Yes. Because, you know, well, let's do a CRM. Well, okay, what about direct mail? Okay, what about SMS? Mar okay, what about email marketing? Okay, what about marketing automation? Okay, what about landing pages? Yeah, okay. And I mean, all those are needed. I, I remember in the early days, like when I had Infusionsoft, I was, you know, back then they foolishly called it an all-in-one platform. But I know. then you quickly realize I need better, I need better e-commerce. I need better landing pages. I need opt-in. I need SMS. I need direct mail. So next thing I know, I've got 12 different things plugged in and it's no longer this super affordable thing. And it's very complex with multiple integrations and, I mean, it was a mess. So how, how do you decide what is the core, core offering? Yes, that's a, that's a very fair and a good question. In my opinion, our, the good news on that is that in the last couple of years, our, that has really tremendously changed. We have re-offering, for instance, two APIs, our, our REST API, what is easy, and our GraphQL already, uh, what is faster and easier to implement in some areas. But the point is, the APIs have uh, realized uh, that the data flow can be easy. And then you have to ask yourself, when you lay back uh, to the user, you have to say, what is really the user doing? When he has really, what kind of data he needs in the flow of his workflow? And then you realize, um, when you go, for instance, what we made the decision, our, one of our partners, PandaDoc, we have the most, this is what the CEO from PandaDoc said, not what I said. He said, this is the best integration that we have seen. We made it in our product seamless integrated. But I'm not a quotation system. I'm not a CPQ system. Why? Because the user, the end user, needs only quickly an offer and then sending that to his customer. The CPQ in itself needs an administrator where not more come to, to, to build the, the framework, the offers, the templates, the, um, the product, blah, 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 blah. But you see, how many of that using it? It's similar, sometimes Excel, that is for me the most and the best software that has ever been written. It's the most, it, it's the best software. It is used by, I know, probably almost a billion people. And the interesting is you can use it with no knowledge and then you can have on Excel, you can, you can die there <laughs> on, on complexity. Yeah? So um, the point is, how many people use more than 10, 15% of the capability of Excel? Yeah. 
So you need in the core account management, definitely contact management, lead management, opportunity management, um, uh, definitely activities or what is already uh, very complex when you work with integrations like Outlook or everything integrated back and forth, be directional with Google or with uh, Microsoft Office 365, blah, blah, blah. But the point is how often you need CPQs? Not very often. How many people need really ticketing what other bring in the suite approach and how, what you need from a sales perspective or from some, you need to see the ticket, you need to see the follow-up of the ticket, but you don't need the whole ticketing system because there is only a few people working on the ticketing system. So make a long story short, you have to sit with the people that are working every day and saying, what do you really need? And then you realize, hey, this is not what, and I basically believe there is 7,000 different SaaS businesses out there today, yeah? Well, not everybody is really good, but there is some that are really good in that what they do. They are perfect in that. Take, for instance, we integrated completely in our whole approach in everything into comp. They're, they're good, but they do one little stuff very, very effectively, right. super effectively, right. or drift, whatever you, you use, or... Um, yeah. So how and, and, and Atlassian is for me also a very good example. Yeah, as a programmer and we as a company definitely we use a lot around Jira and Jira tickets and everything. But how many people use that outside? So right. why I should bring that into a CRM? What the data? The data maybe are interesting, but not the software. Makes sense. For sure. Okay. How did you convince early people to? give you a try? Were you, were you promoting it as, hey, this is brand new, be bleeding edge, be a beta user, get out ahead of the curve, you know, get in before everybody else does and give some input? You know, how do you, because a CRM is an important piece of a company's business. Correct. Uh, and to give something to try this brand new could be risky, maybe even fatal. So how do you convince those early customers to take that chance? Good question. Or I think it's um, you showed. Was it a, I mean, was it riding Adobe's coattails basically, and, and that people are like, well, if Adobe's backing it, it's got to be okay. It was no, that kind of key? no, because no. Adobe was only the technology that we're using, and it was okay. not even visible to the customer. He was not. It's there. right now. Our we are our backend is written everything in Python, and nobody cares yeah, how you write that or in Angular or whatever you do. Yeah, so nobody cares about that. So Adobe was not helping us in that area to sell the product, yeah, not right. at all, because the people were not even knowing that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the concept that we brought to the table, the visual concept, were appealing to some people, and you start really as in everything, you start not with the big ones. Yeah, you start with smaller and mid-sized ones, and I think um, that was building up. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the, the concept was appealing or, and or, the people were realizing when they used the software, that makes sense. This is good. And they liked it. And so they just are, were are using it. And, and, yeah. and at that time, we had this concept uh, as a hybrid. Uh, we had instant um, background synchronization. So we were winning a lot of companies, especially in the pharmaceutical in industry, where they were saying, we need offline capability. So you could use the software in the plane, you could use it when you have no internet mm -hmm. connectivity. And that was for many people very important. Right. Today, it's a little bit different because in the last 10 years, as we know, our internet connectivity is almost everywhere. Right. But that was not 9, 10, 11. Right. Very cool. Yeah. So for those listening, uh, if they want to try your platform, I mean, I'm, I'm linking to it. It's pipelinersales.com. Uh, you've got a free trial, right? You've got monthly options. You have discounts for annual. Um, is it still a, a B2B play? Is that who should give yes. this a try? Yes. Yeah, it's okay. a B2B play and it's really for sales people. 
are, and the beauty comes when there are more salespeople because the sales manager or they all are when you visualize, for instance, the buying center. We have, uh, we have created something. Maybe that's a last point that is interesting. I believe strongly everything is going more and more in intangible. Why? Because the intangible have more value as the tangible. Tangible goes away sometimes. Yeah? The intangible stays. But in a sales action, what is intangible? It's the relationships that when a team is selling, how they are interacting. So we created a buying center that is visualized between the buyer, who is the buyer, who is the naysayer, who is maybe their budget holder, who's that. And that is correlated to the relationship mapping because intangibles values are more important in the future than the tangible. Tangible right. is going. Um, that's why I believe capital is a tangible asset, but it's, it's, it's not the value because the real value is what we do. We talk to each other and there comes maybe an inspiration. How you, how you, how, how you value that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm just, um, I mean, I'm inspired by your story. I mean, digging in, launching this, moving uh, countries, uh doing it you know i'll be 50 here in about six weeks so oh, um, congratulations man uh, come know. on i'm 60 I, almost getting come on i don't know how i feel about it but hey it is what it is right i couldn't imagine moving to a whole nother country uh and getting started right now so i mean that took some guts and some brains so uh you know kudos to you for making that happen thank you no it's it's i have a great team i have great people around me very smart people and are building um, really are something that is uh, with the bigger purpose and the bigger purpose. This is why we could win our, our not only the DePaul University or many other universities where you right now are, I don't know how many students out, yeah, are using Pipeliner and are because the university felt sales the story that salespeople are wealth creator and peace producer and sales get more, again, a positive tone. Yeah. And it's not so negative. Yeah? Salespeople are lousy. I always make a joke about that. If you have two daughters yeah, and they come home and they are in the age where they can get married and one has a lawyer, the other one has a sales rep or a sales manager. What do you would say to the daughter? Yeah when maybe there is a, doc, a doctor, a lawyer, and a sales manager. Yeah? <laughs> and, and I think that is typical today. Even salespeople are so important, we don't value them. We don't really educate them. Yeah. Most people say, when you don't know in life what you really do, go in sales. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I jumped into sales in 1997 right out of the Air Force and never looked back. <laughs> All right. So as soon as uh, you get that Austrian white wine, you let me know, and we're gonna we're gonna go live here in Temecula and do a taste test. That uh, I we will do that. <laughs> we're not a leaner. Yeah. All right, Nicholas, all the way from L.A. Man, thanks for coming on the show. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for the talk. Have, Have a, a good great one. day. You too. Bye. Tell you what, I've been a homebody for a long time, but. Um, been cooped up now two and a half weeks and uh, who knows how many more weeks we got to go I think it's going to be on the lower end of the estimate that's been going out lately but uh, I think I may actually go to LA and get some wine you know I have this sudden urge to uh, meet with people face to face crazy huh although I think once I get back into jujitsu I may be a um, so sore and knotted up I may not be able to go anywhere for a long time we shall see See how good uh, running uh, helps and just doing drills at home alone. I think it'll be okay. But uh, I told you, huh? Cool story. I mean, nice guy, uh, very uh, approachable, very humble, and uh, just making good things happen, okay? And um, go do the same, all right? Make good things happen. Uh, ignore the naysayers. Believe in the, the best of breed approach, okay? Over deliver. If you do that, you're going to grow. You'll, and you'll sell yourself right out of any setback this virus has created. If you need some help, some encouragement, some ideas, join us, theimplementors.com. It's the free group. You can ask some questions, and I do my best to answer those very quickly. 
uh, 30-day sales growth is for those who want to invest in themselves and get even more help, on-demand content, books, and more. Okay, and again, use promo code APRIL for half off. Thanks for listening. Keep your chin up. Sell yourself out of any issue. I'll go sell something.